I would like to say mm. a good morning to you, um, Samuel, and say it's really exciting. I'm excited to have you here at the village to welcome you as a guest because we've spoken a couple of times and the service that you provide, um, I think, will be really valuable for new families. So would you mind introducing yourself and talking a little bit about um, your business and how you help new families? My name is Samuel and I'm a pediatrician based in Sydney and the founder of Telebaby. Now, we offer telehealth video consults for newborns up to the age of 12 months, Australia-wide, seven days a week. So instead of waiting for weeks or months to see a pediatrician, you could just book online, speak to a pediatrician today. And it's all nice and easy from the comfort of your home. Fabulous. So unlike a normal pediatrician appointment, do you need a referral? So you don't need a referral. Anyone can just book online. But if you do get a referral from a GP, you will get a Medicare rebate. Tell me who is likely to choose telehealth over maybe seeing a somebody in their local community? Look, in Australia, it's quite new. It's a new concept. But more and more families, that especially with newborns, they don't want to leave the house with a newborn. And as you know, taking a baby out, you have to take, you know, clothes, spare clothes, bibs, nappies, stroller, car seats, driving, going around. It's not, not easy. And with this surface, it's actually very easy when parents have questions and they don't want to leave the house. It's very comfortable. So for most issues, I mean, with babies, if it's reflux, colic, suspected milk allergies, constipations, or lots of other issues, they can just book a telehealth, sit at home without leaving the house. It's very convenient. And also the partner can also join. You don't need to miss work. It's very easy, right? So you can book any time that suits you. And you actually speak to a pediatrician. It's a 30-minute video consult. And we can sort most things through the video consultations. So I think it's more and more becoming more and more acceptable. And people can see the advantages of telehealth. Absolutely. I think I was critical when I first heard that there was this service because I think many of the things you need to see the baby, maybe examine their body. So I, you've enlightened me on the, on the many benefits. Do you, would you mind talking about um, potentially one of the most common things that people might think about booking an appointment with you? For okay. So look, many times milk allergy is a big topic. So suspected milk allergy where they need a special formula and um, babies look lots of babies have similar symptoms crying unsettled baby and uh, vomiting and this could fall into a it can, lots of diagnosis are possible if it's just colic maybe it's reflux maybe the baby needs medication for reflux maybe it's a milk allergy and they need a special formula right so these are the mainstay um, there's babies with constipation and there's hip dysplasia that I'm following up, rashes and lots of other issues. But these are the main ones. Talk about maybe how those follow ups happen. Uh, is it just following up with you or are you talking about referring to other um, no. health professionals? How does that work? So. In Australia, there's very good support for babies. So from the beginning, there's a midwife, pediatrician, lactation consultants in hospital. And when children go home, they have the child and family health nurse, a nurse that comes to their house and supporting the parents and the babies. So the baby is actually checked by the midwife, examined uh, with, by the midwife after birth, by a pediatrician, then later on by the nurse, child and family health nurse, and later on at six weeks by the GP as well. So there's lots of people looking at the baby, examining the baby and helping. Now, when this, when they feel, 
when parents feel or the doctors or the lactation consultant or midwives or nurses feel that something else might be wrong, then they refer to me. Okay. Oh, if parents are just worried and they want to refer themselves, just book online. And I think it's everyone can, and, and this also answers the questions about telehealth, because it's not like I'm the first person on video seeing the baby, right? It's like the baby has been seen by multiple health providers, which is reassuring. And most of the issues are very common to many babies. And it's the telehealth is very good by just listening to the parents and listening to the symptoms and seeing the baby um, online, you can get lots of information. And especially when you can, parents can send photos of rashes, videos of the breathing. They can, it's, I think it's very good. You get the whole picture and it's same. Um, and obviously they can follow up if they want, they can follow up again. And look, with my with telebaby service, what we offer is a third we, we offer a 30 minute video consult, email support for one week to ask as many questions as you like, send videos, photos, 24 so just ask whatever you want, we're here to support you. And after a week, we call you again or do a video call. So you have a follow one week of a private pediatrician, the same pediatrician, ask as many questions as you like, and you have the support. It's a good feeling, and we can change and go along the way and see if we need to change anything or not, rather than going on Facebook, Google, and listening to all kinds of advice. You can speak to a pediatrician, and that's the follow-up. And obviously, later on, if they want to follow up two months later, three months later, we have an option for follow up with the same pediatrician. Sounds like a, a VIP luxury service. Um, that's about it, literally most, even a GP appointment, you get you you're there for fifteen minutes and then you leave and then yeah. the questions crop up. So that that sounds incredibly valuable. Yeah. Can you talk about a little bit about maybe? Um, something that you regularly have clients booking to see you and that there's some very common advice that you give out. It's one of maybe the most common um, reasons to get a consult with you or a question that might not be necessary and just some general advice would help put parents' minds at ease. Is there anything like that? Yeah, there is. I mean, I see a lot of... I see many parents that th there's two different groups, the breastfeeding and the formula fed. Now, with the we'll start with the formula fed babies. Many of them change formulas. They feel that the baby's not doing well because they're unsettled. They posit, their poo is not, they think it's not normal. And what they do is they tend to change, change the different formula. And after a few days, change to another one. And then they hear from a friend or from someone that there's a better formula. So many times they come to me after they change so many formulas for something that wasn't a problem to begin with, right? So it's really important to understand if there is a problem to start with. And if there is, um, then we tease out the, obviously after looking at the photos of the poo, is it really um, like a lactose intolerant poo, which is frothy mucusy, like explosive diarrhea, sometimes associated with bloating of the abdomen because of the lactose intolerance, and sometimes a nappy rash, which is worse than the usual. And then you can just change your lactose free formula. The, the thing is to to find out the cause, because it could be a lactose intolerance, as I said, it could be just colic, right? And colic is a very common, is very common in babies starting in the second week, peaks at six weeks, and goes away at three to four months. And babies cry a lot, right? And in colic, no one knows what's the cause of the crying. And that's the trouble, is it just, which is a normal phenomenon, 
right? The colic and it goes away, it gets better. But the thing is, is it just colic or is there something else going on? And, and for example, you asked me what I see. And so for example, I've seen, I saw a kid not long ago. I see obviously various, uh, lots of different, uh, I see lots of different things. But uh, for example, not long ago, I had a baby, a two month old baby that was very unsettled, positing a lot. And but, so it was put on uh, anti-reflux formula, an AR formula for his reflux, presumed reflux. And the unsettledness was presumed to be colic, right? And nothing helped. And then he had developed constipation. And then they saw me. And after talking to the parents and listening to all the story, they told me that there was blood in the poo, like two episodes with a bit of blood in the poo. And there's a bit of eczema on the knees and on the elbows, a little bit of eczema. And, uh, and after looking at his weight gain, you saw that the baby was gaining weight okay at the beginning, but now he's not gaining as much weight as expected. And in this case, I, I think that the reflux, the what's called reflux, it was actually a manifestation of vomiting and not gaining weight and everything was part of a milk allergy. And after changing the formula, not to, instead of an AR formula to a, I can prescribe Pepti Junior formula, then everything just settled, looked well, the eczema improved, the poos, gaining weight, sleeping well, no vomiting or positing anymore. And I mean, that, that's the rewarding aspects of telebaby and helping babies and i'm just saying if it wasn't for the telebaby and this is something i see a lot they would have changed more formulas and more formula till till seeing a pediatrician or another gp or another so so like, with with little babies it's saving that time of of basically stress for parents and babies because if their baby is not happy then it's really hard for them to to feel stress-free or comfortable there's, exactly. there's so many unknowns with new babies yeah exactly. This, a, a little bit of a controversial question colic is colic a thing is it an illness a condition babies have or is it really talking about unexplained crying when there is no other cause found for babies crying it's an excellent question very good question and I wrote an article on my website about colic. And it's a bit too long, maybe, but I tried to, to put all the information possible. So actually, look, colic, the problem with saying colic, it sounds like a disease, right? The baby has colic. And even though it's most likely not, and it's more of something we don't know, right? It's babies that cry a lot. And normal baby, not I won't say normal, but healthy babies, cry about two hours a day up to three hours a day so that's the normal and colic also the definition of colic is very controversial lots of different um, definitions but generally we say if the baby cries more than three hours per day for more than three days a week and and in a baby under three months we call this colic and is it something, some people say that some, some people believe that it's because of immaturity of the gut, right? After being in the womb for such a long time, you start now drinking milk and it's just crying. It's unsettled because of this change, which can be probably normal. Others believe it's because of increased serotonin and at night there's more serotonin and this can cause more a smooth muscle contraction and the gastrointestinal tract is made of smooth muscle. And that's why maybe babies cry more in the evenings and colic, as you know, is worse in the evenings. Some think it's a kind of migraine and there's, it's such a complex and also there's some relationship between an interaction of mom or dad with a baby that can cause more crying. So there's so many theories and that's why some call it the period of purple crying 
And it's it just appeared. So you, it's a purple is an acronym that stands for all the symptoms of and the colic. And which tells you it's not a disease. It's not an issue. It's just a period. It has a start. It will end by three months. If you're unlucky by four months. And I, I believe that it's not. I believe that it's not a disease and it's not a problem. A colic is just something that we need to help. Obviously, that baby is unsettled with what we call colic. And there's things we can do to help, right? That's the issue. What to do, how to help parents that have a baby with colic. And I had a baby, The she's now 18 years old, but my first daughter had terrible colic, nothing helped. And obviously we always teach people, uh, teach parents to do the basics, to go back to the basics when the baby's crying, to make sure it, you don't need to change the poo, to make sure the baby's not hungry, and to hold the baby, try and settle the baby, try to swaddle, to, sh to speak to the baby, to swing gently the baby, to massage the abdomen, to put the baby in a warm bath, maybe take them on a ride in your car. And um, so we to make sure they're not hungry. Sometimes babies swallow lots of air and maybe that's why they're very hungry, especially if they're bottle fed. So sometimes changing the teeth, but so colic is a, is a mystery, but it goes away. That's the good news. Eventually it goes away. And if I can give tips on colic, besides doing the things that I mentioned, um, there's some, lots of medications out there, lots of medications. And look, I've looked at like 40 years of research, I looked at PubMed, all the articles that came out to see what works and what didn't work. I learned a lot on the way as well. And probably the medication, look, what works I think the most, what I recommend would be this different opinions. Yeah, but after looking at all the things, gripe water can work. Okay, gripe water is different depending depending on the company. Yeah, but the ingredients in gripe water can help. The studies that show that it helps. And uh, we have infants friends in Australia also has some dill and chamomile. So things that can help. I like Willoughby's. Willoughby's Wind and Colic. It's a pharmacy in Melbourne. Also makes a special and formulation natural from belladonna extract. And also I have lots of good feedback. And Nan Care, which is a company that produces probiotics. So it has a strain of lactobacillus, ruderi. And there's lots of studies about probiotics in with colic. And they've tested so many and there's no real evidence besides this lactobacillus ruderi, which really helps in breastfed babies. But in formula fed babies, it's not as obvious. There's maybe or maybe not. So probiotics are good bacteria. And one of the reasons is that some believe that colic, which I didn't mention before, is some, um, when there's the gut bacteria, the microbiome in your gut, there's, there's no equilibrium yet because it's a baby. And the hypothesis is that if you give good bacteria, it will help with absorbing and with um, will make you the baby more settled. Okay. So, and the company that sells it here is the Nan Care Probiotics, BioGaia Nan Care, five drops a day. So, these are the four that I recommend. And there's not much evidence of the gas trapping agents, Cimeticon, which I won't mention company companies' names. And that's that's my recommendations. Fabulous. So I think with colic, people are, are looking for answers. They want some relief. So what, in summary, what you're saying is some of those remedies may be useful for some babies. None are specifically the best, and, and any of them might have some relief, but not cure colic because 
it's possibly not a condition as such. It's a it's a period of time that you can get some symptomatic relief from. Does that sound exactly, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I can make myself more clear, it's definitely it will go away. And I think the measures of, as I said before, the settling, massage, this is definitely the mainstay. And I'm not, I wouldn't push for medications. But I know I live in a place where I see, you know, parents and they all want to buy things and do and everyone wants to feel it's difficult to see your baby scream and crying. And there's nothing you can do, it's just ongoing screaming and screaming, and it's very difficult. And you want to do something, right? So it's easy to say really? to people, eh, it's okay, it will go away, and it's not a disease, and it's a normal phenomenon. But practically, people want, me as a parent, I wanted something. And I checked lots of things when I, when I had my first newborn. And nothing helped with my daughter. I mean, just time. At three months, it went away, around three months, and nothing really helped. So it's not that there's a magic bullet you'll give this, but it might help. So if it's really severe and you feel like uh, you need something, I would maybe try one of the things I recommended. Fabulous. And I think as well for new parents, you want some reassurance from professional that you've excluded some of the serious concerns. And so you, you can't exclude those until you've spoken to somebody to reassure you. Otherwise, it, you're guessing it's out there. Something I, I think that, that you brought up, which is really useful, that I've found since we've spoken and I've got to know you, is that your website and your um, social platforms have some great information. You can see there clearly is a lot of research that rather than just looking at Dr. Google, we're looking at what you've extrapolated from, as you said, years of research. So I really recommend people to go to subscribe to your forums and, and kind of get that trickle of information. I, I find it, I find it useful. And I refer um, some of my families to that site as well, because it's, uh, thank you for all the work you put in. I know it takes yeah. a long time to do that. Is there something else that um, I know a common question I get personally? Um, it's yeah. why well, I say common. It's it's one of the familiar ones. It's not the the mo the highest in numbers. Is thinking about baby circumcision and what are the recommendations around that? Is there time frames that it should be done or should be left? Or if you've got any good information, look, circumcision is a controversial topic as well. And I get asked about, I get it, I get asked about it a lot. And generally, look, circumcision is good. The good things about it, the pros, are that it reduces the incidence of urinary tract infections in children that have kidney problems like reflux. It reduces the obviously the complications of foreskin issues like phimosis when it's too tight around the penis and because you obviously doing circumcision you cut this area and it reduces the incidence of HIV and sexually transmitted diseases and obviously it reduces the risk of a rare cancer or tumor of the glands of the penis okay so these are the good things about circumcision. Now, the some would argue that it's not ethical to circumcise a child without their consent. And that in the short term, there's also complications of there's it's also it's a painful procedure. And there's some like everything in life, every procedure has its own risks. And bleeding, or if you cut too much, it can cause damage to the urethra. So there are complications. So, and some say it's not, if you don't do circumcision for girls, you shouldn't do it for boys as well. And that the foreskin is also can protect the glands of the penis, which is a very sensitive area, especially during childhood. So there's uh, here and there, there's lots of opinions. And you have to think also of the cultural, some, for example, for example, Jews, Jewish and Muslims, it's a religious reason for doing the circumcision so they circumcise their children and now the age of when to do it is a great question 
okay? And some places I worked, um, especially in Muslims, they did the circumcision before the child even left the postnatal ward. So on day two, so day two of life or three of life. Jews do it at age eight, always. Eight days, they do the circumcision. I've seen here kids, all the kids, 12, 13-year-olds, Taurus Islanders, and so on, that it's part of the adulthood. So they do it at this age, some of them. So that's, there's no right or wrong, but I definitely would recommend to do it earlier than later. So if the baby is healthy and not jaundiced, and looks well, um, I will do it in the first few weeks or months of life if you decide to do it rather than, than doing it later because the healing is much, much faster. And in regards to medical reasons for doing the circumcision, um, if a child has a tendency for recurrent urinary tract infections or has issues with the foreskin like when it's too tight and foreskin issues then the recommendation will be let's do it medically that's the i think everyone would agree that foreskin issues and recurrent urinary tract infection it's worthwhile doing the circumcision otherwise it's really personal personal belief parents make the decision that their child is getting circumcised What's the starting process to speak, to get a referral from a paediatrician? Is it specialist clinics to order people get them from who does the circumcision? Good question. So it's in Australia, it's that you can be any doctor can do the circumcision. OK, so you can be a gynecologist, you can be a urologist, a surgeon, or you can be a paediatrician, you can be a anything right? You can be an orthopedic surgeon. So anyone who has the ability to do it has the, can do it, right? But what I recommend, I always tell parents, so I'm from Sydney. I know lots of people in Sydney and there's different, there's different techniques when doing the circumcision. And I tell the parents, look, it's important to ask um, wherever you want to do the circumcision, whoever does the circumcision, to ask how they do it. Because some doctors, what they do is they use local anesthetic into the inguinal region, okay? And the local anesthetic, actually, it's a nerve block, and it blocks all the pain to the penile shaft. And then they can cut, do it properly, there's zero pain. The only pain is to put the needle um, and give the local anesthetic around the nerves, okay? Which is not at the penis itself, it's in the inguinal region. So that's, I think, a, an excellent technique. I like this technique. And then the procedure is very quick and they put gauze over it with some oil to keep it always, um, so it won't get um, stuck to the nappy and it heals very nicely. Some other doctors prefer the belt technique. It's like a plastic thing that they connect to the tip of the penis. And it takes, with pressure, what happens, it causes pressure on the foreskin. And then it falls off after a few days. Just the tissue dies. So it's, it's a matter of preference. That's another, it takes quite a few days till it falls off. And... Yeah, so basically you have to see what kind of technique they use. And yeah, I would go with a pediatric surgeon. I think that's the best. Or a urologist. Okay. Yeah. And so would you need a, a referral for that or can you right. refer yourself to a... And yeah, you need a referral. Any doctor, GP or when they ask me, I recommend as well. I give them a referral as well. Yes. So I'm wondering what is one of the most common... Um, concerns that you get asked as a pediatrician? So many times when I work in a private hospital, checking babies, many times the first question that parents ask me is, does this, does my baby have a tongue tie? That's the first question. And I'm amazed because in the past few years, there's lots of focus about tongue tie. And actually, if you look at the 
at Google, you read online, they blame everything on tongue tie. They blame the colic, the crying, milk allergies, not feeding well, constipation, swallowing it. Everything is because of the tongue tie, which obviously isn't correct. Um, most of the time, so tongue ties basically is when you have a piece of skin under the tongue that it's called the lingual frenulum, which restricts the motion of the tongue, all right? Now, it's not just about how it looks because most babies have it's the frenulum there. It's not about the way it looks. It's also about the function. Does it disturb or doesn't disturb? And there's lots of different assessments and tools that you use, Hazel Baker and the BTAT. And there's lots of different ways to assess if there's a tongue tie, not just by the way it looks, but the functionality of the tongue. And it's important to note, look, generally tongue tie, what we everyone agrees, it can cause, when it is severe, it can cause problems with breastfeeding, which is by latching or latching or, or by causing just nipple pain because of the wrong, because of the suck, the abnormal movement of the tongue. So nipple pain and latching definitely can cause problems with breastfeeding. It can cause later on problems with articulation, okay, in some babies. And potentially later on, if it's severe, you cannot lick your lower lip or kissing, that's later on. But that's in severe cases. Let's, now, the prevalence of tongue tie is less than 1% in some places, and in other places is 11%, because it depends what the criteria you use. And so it's really the prevalence, but today the diagnosis is increasing and increasing. And what I'm trying to say, to cut a long story short, to make it more simple, okay? So most babies, you'll see a, what appears to be a tongue tie, which is basically a normal frenulum, the normal skin piece of tissue under the tongue, which is normal, shouldn't cause any problems. Now, if you feel that there's a, if there's a problem with breastfeeding, with nipple pain, or with latching, then I think the best thing to do is not to snip it immediately, but to consult with a lactation consultant. And usually this fixes the problem just by changing the position and teaching the mom how to breastfeed, this usually fixes the problem. Now, if despite, after using a lactation consultant, you see things are just not working and the lactation consultants, oh, they're very aware of tongue ties and they feel probably there is something, then it's worth fixing the problem. And what we do is either use scissors which is called phrenotomy. We cut with scissors the frenulum. Usually we give some sucrose before to prevent the pain. And because it's a flap of tissue, it's it really, from my experience, it does not hurt when you did very early on. I look at the face of the baby, they barely cry and they stop. It's So it sounds worse than what it is. That's called lingual phrenotomy. So either with scissors or some dentists do it with laser and they cauterize it and just cut the flap of skin. So cut a long story short, most of the time it's not an issue. And if there is a lactation consultant think it's an issue, then it's worthwhile doing the phrenotomy. And if I can mention one more thing is that nowadays there's also lip tie and buckle or cheek tie, which is just ridiculous. There's no evidence for these things that they cause problems, even though some doctors, dentists say, we need to cut the inside between the cheek, there's a small piece of tissue. And the kind of long story short, there's no evidence to cut the lip tie or the buckle cheek ties as well. Only if it really causes which in extreme cases, maybe, but uh, very rare. That's really useful. So the statistics are showing that the research shows there's there's very little um, problems often associated, even if there's a visible frenulum that seems to be restricted. 
So to go back to basic, see a lactation consultant rather than jump to that invasive surgery. So. And I've done lots of um, lingual phrenotomies in my private practice in the past few years, only when needed. And most of the time, I just have to tell the parents, guys, no need to do anything. Really, I promise you it won't cause any, and the speech articulation issues, it's a small flap. It's, it doesn't cause, it won't cause any issues. And I didn't cut my son's frenulum, which was quite, looked very significant, but didn't uh, cause any issues. And at the same note, if I'll say just to complete the tongue tie, so we look, if the tongue tie is, the tongue is in the shape of a heart, because the frenulum reaches all the way to the tip and causes like an indentation. It looks like a tongue, plus it reaches and the tongue cannot move beyond the lips, okay? The baby cannot move the tongue beyond the lips or cannot move the tongue midway between when opening the mouth or crying. It's not supposed to reach the palate, but midway between the palate and the floor of the mouth, then maybe it's an indication for, but that's a big topic, but but basically, and that's why the best is to be assessed and lactation consultants are excellent in doing so. That's great advice. Thank you very much. Okay. I was wondering that, that if, if anyone has any reservations about whether telehealth might be a useful um, first port of call for a baby that they don't know whether there will be a physical examination needed. Do you have any examples, any stories of a time when um, exactly that, that you were able to have a great outcome and and what your process was that you had a telehealth consultation and then what flowed next? Yes, the, look, there's lots of stories. I mean, mo almost all my consultations, I feel like I'm helping parents, babies. And as I said before, because they do see different various health professionals before, um, it's much easier to do the telehealth. And now there's lots of stories from the reflexy baby by giving some omeprazole, low sec, after all the other measures didn't help with the reflux, and suddenly the baby sleeps well at night, to the milk protein allergy, where you give special formulas and you sort out everything, and to cases where, you know, I had a case of an older child that had a pulled elbow, so the parents pulled the elbow, that's a 18-month-old child, and it's the first time I've done a pulled elbow reduction, the technique by just explaining through a video telehealth to the parents what to do. So this was very rewarding. And this saves them a trip to the emergency department. So it's knowing when you can do it according to the mechanism and what to do. And, and the parents were did amazingly, I mean, brilliantly. So that's one. And recently, so I have the, these cases, which is have lots of milk allergy, reflux, and so on. And I had a very special case um, about a month ago of a 15-month-old that actually had some nodules, small two um, nodules on the scalp, which is very common in babies. Sometimes you see it can be lymph nodes or it can be some benign tumor growth that sometimes needs to be removed, but it's common that you see some lumps on the scalp, but the child was otherwise well, sent by the GP for an ultrasound. And the ultrasound said it's just a reaction to hair growing inwards instead of outwards. And parents just wanted just a second opinion. So for example, telehealth, I couldn't feel obviously, but the parents told me it's small lumps, showed me photos, which is the good thing about telehealth. You can just share videos, photos. The parents told me we touch, it's hard, there's nothing much. It's about two centimeters in size. And I said, look, something here doesn't sound right with the ultrasound report because it's not something we see. You know, I've never seen this in such a young child. And cut a long story short, moving forward, I sent them to an ultrasound to a place where I trust. And after receiving the results that they're also, they're not sure what it is. It can be lots of things. I arranged for a dermatology biopsy, which showed a lymphoma, unfortunately. But after rearranging 
um, oncology admission in the hospital and bloods were fine. Everything else was fine with a the baby. They found a widespread leukemia with metastatic different areas and so on. And the good news thing, I'm very happy to hear that she's doing well after one month of chemotherapy. The, lymphoma, the leukemia actually is not seen in the blood, bone marrow and anywhere else. So it's great news and fingers crossed she continues to be well. And that's, I think this is, for example, an example where you would say telehealth. How does telehealth, we, without examining a patient? And, and that's the thing with, in Australia, if you want to see, get a second opinion from a pediatrician, it would have taken weeks, if not months. And here it was quick. And it's also, I think the service is very good. I can talk to people, arrange, do everything very quickly. So in like about 10 days, we've done a repeat ultrasound biopsy and admission and oncology, which is unheard of. It's very quick. And that, that's, I think, a good example of why telehealth does work. Absolutely. Um, that sounds like the most fantastic outcome for that family. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm very happy, yes. How do you follow that kind of life-saving story? Um, would you mind talking a little bit about what led you to be where you are? You said it's a new service. So what what experience have you got as a, as a pediatrician? Okay, so I finished medical school in Budapest, Hungary, and then I left to Jerusalem, to Israel, where I completed my pediatric training for five years. I worked as a pediatrician in the community, and then I decided to come to Australia with my wife and three kids and to complete a fellowship in pediatric emergency medicine at Westmead Children's Hospital, where I work till today as a consultant. So after finishing the pediatric emergency medicine fellowship, instead of going back to my country, we liked Australia and we decided to stay. And since then, I've been working in the emergency department at Westmead Children's Hospital and at Liverpool Hospital. And I work in the Sydney Southwest Private Hospital, checking babies and in the special care nursery, as well as I had my private practice for a few years. And in my private practice, I saw lots of babies, especially the ones that came to follow up with me after seeing them in hospital. And... I saw the same problems, the same issues, and it's it's very difficult because the waiting time to see me or other pediatricians is months, three, four months. So what I did, I had always slots every day that I worked. I had slots because I knew it will fill up with babies. And then I said, look, then COVID came and I saw people had trouble um, seeing a pediatrician and seeing me, even though I worked as usual. But it was just go. It was difficult, right, to leave the house. And I called many parents and I talked to them over the phone. And I basically did telehealth. And I said, "Wow, it's working well." People gave parents gave me great feedback. And I said, "You know what? That's what I want to do." And I have passion. Look, I love everything in pediatrics, emergency medicine, babies. Really, it's an amazing job. But I have passion for babies and helping parents when they need it the most and I thought you know what let's do a telehealth service telebaby so I decided to leave I closed my private practice completely I left and I opened this service and in my mind I said what I want is to for people to be able to just speak to pediatricians any day the same day maybe the next day but something that will be easy Anyone can access it, access my service, remote areas, rural areas, anyone in Australia with a GP referral, without a GP, and just talk to a pediatrician and save all the time and hassle of listening to other advice from Facebook and Instagram and cause more harm than good. And I said even more than that, I, I wanted to be able to ask questions and be able to communicate even after the telehealth. And that's why 
I came with this telly baby. So you have the consult, you have the email support, you, the parents send photos, videos. And as I said for, before, it's like a private pediatrician for a week. Okay, and that's, and I love what I do. And I, it's, it's nice waking up in the morning, meeting new families and helping families. And every child is different. It sounds like the same, crying, baby, vomiting, reflux. But it's, most of the time it is reassurance, but it's finding exactly these cases where it's not just a regular, something's wrong and you have to investigate further. And for this, you need the experience, especially with telehealth. And when it comes to telehealth, experience is, I think, the most important. Because when you have experience, you know something's not right. This should be different. And that's why I love what I do and hope to continue. It's really clear in talking to you how much um, personally you gain out of, of being able to help people rather than just see a, a big number of clients and, and patients. Yeah. So that's very clear. Thank you for that. And and that, that certainly is reassuring to me to think that um, you really do know what you're doing. And, and it can seem, I think, when somebody is an expert at what they do, when they've got so many years of experience, it makes it look so easy. But actually, it's the it's the years that led to where you are now that yeah. helps to cut through the the irrelevant information that you can kind of pinpoint what's different. So mm -hmm. that's good to know. We've reached the part in the conversation where I ask all the experts about a pearl of wisdom. And I wondered what it was that you would love every new mum to know. This time flies very fast. And so try to enjoy it as much as you can. That's great advice. And I think, is there something different that you wish every new dad would know? It's all about teamwork. Right, it's not an easy period. And I think helping each other as much as possible, if it's taking the older kids, taking care of laundry or helping out in the house. And I think helping each other because it's at the end of the day, you're all trying to do the best for the baby and for each other. And teamwork is always the best. One practical piece of advice you could give. Okay. Burping is very important, as we know. Okay. We want to let all the air bubbles come out of the stomach. And some babies, it's very easy to burp. You just hold them upright, shake them a little bit, and they just burp. Very easy. But some babies, it's very difficult. And if they don't burp, then they have the hiccups. Sometimes they're very gassy and uncomfortable. So a practical tip would be, and I prepared this in advance, if you look at the anatomy of the stomach, as you can see, when food comes down the esophagus into the stomach, it fills with formula or breast milk. And when breast milk is here, the air always goes above the fluid. So what happens because of this shape of the stomach, sometimes the air bubbles are trapped here. And even if you shake the baby, the air bubbles will not go out and up the esophagus, but will stay stuck here. So one practical tip is put your baby on the back, lying on the back. This will move the fluid in such a way that the air bubbles will be on top and then it will just come up. So what you can do is either just put the baby on the back just for a few seconds on your lap and then pull them up again, upright, or putting them on their left side, just tilted to the left, which will, it's difficult because the cameras, I think, the opposite way, it's a mirror image. But if you put the baby on the left side, it will put will move the air bubbles above and it will be easier for it to come out. So trying different positions for burping can really help. It's a great visual to see where that air might be trapped. So thank you for that. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. I wonder if there is something that, um, is there something that you would say was rated? We're, we're asking all the experts if there is one thing, maybe from your experience as a new new family, is the one thing that made a big difference to your life with a new baby? 
Yeah, so I think definitely Rated was a dummy, a pacifier. Helped us a lot with my first daughter. It really changed our lives. But on the other hand, I must say that with the other kids, they weren't interested and didn't need it. So I would say it's very good pacifier in some kids, but in others, it's not. So I don't think you should push for a pacifier, for a dummy or not. If the child likes it, excellent. If they don't, that's fine. Totally fine. Brilliant. Is there an item that you would have contemplated, something that maybe you didn't even know existed then, it didn't exist, or that you found out later is a good thing that you recommend to new parents, or something that you just... Um, maybe it was out of your range of possibility when you had a baby? And not really. Things were much simpler then. Less options. We had everything. Life was more simple. So that's <laughs> really true, I think. I think that's good advice in itself. Is there something that's overrated? So I would go with pacifier, dummy again, because many parents are obsessed. They want the dummy and they try and they buy different companies and spend so much money on different dummies. And sometimes babies do great without dummies as well. So if your child likes it, as I said before, excellent. If they don't, also excellent. And finally, what about wasted? If you're thinking about something that you could perhaps buy more ethically or could be more environmentally friendly, is there one specific thing you could think of? I can say telehealth. Look, telehealth is lots of things you can sort out by telehealth without driving and using petrol and cars from the comfort of your home. So I would say telehealth appointments. And, and also time economy as well, by the sounds of it, saving lots of time. Lots of time, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. I'd like to ask maybe how people go about finding you and your service. Can you tell us your maybe contact details? And you can find me on www.telebaby.com.au. I have my website where you can book, contact me through the website. I have social media, Telebaby Australia on Facebook or Instagram. And it's very easy. You just book online. You don't need any so that to download any software. You just choose the date and time that suits you. Click and you make a payment. I'm happy to talk about your prices and what people can expect to pay from your service. When you make an appointment with Telebaby, you'll receive a 30-minute video consult, seven days of email support where you can ask any question via email, send photos, videos, whatever you like. And you'll receive another phone or video call after a week. The price for that is $300 without a GP referral. But if you do have a GP referral, you'll get a Medicare rebate and you'll pay $158 out of pocket. For a follow-up appointment, it's the same. You'll get also a 30-minute video consult, seven days email support, and another phone or video call consult, follow-up. And this is for the price of $220. If you have a GP referral, you'll pay $149 out of pocket. That's it. So we're available seven days a week. So every day um working hours saturday morning it's 9 to 12 and sunday afternoon be between 4 and 8 o'clock in 4 in the afternoon till 8 o'clock eastern australian eastern time and if anyone wants you know needs to consult in the evening or later or something happens just drop us an email it's at contact at telebaby.com.au or through the website, just write an email and I'll, we'll do everything to assist. Please. Fabulous. And so I'm not sure if you mentioned already, but you we've been talking about telebabies, but this, this availability actually extends to an older age group. Is that the same yes. contact details? Everything's the same, yeah. Lately, 
we had the parents ask me, Dr. Samuel, we want to see, we have a 15-month-old or a two-year-old child that would like to do a telebaby, and it's only up to 12 months. Are you able to see us? And, you know, I helped here and there. And then I decided, look, why not? So now we extended our service. It's called Telebaby and Beyond. And it's from one years old to 16. But it's only for acute issues, only for sick children. So, for example, if you have constipation or fever, or you're vomiting, or you have eczema, or it's an injury and you're not sure if to go to hospital or not, it's only for these things because I'm a pediatric, I work in the emergency department in Westmead Children's Hospital. And as a pediatric emergency consultant, I'm happy to give advice and help parents and help older kids, but it's not for chronic issues. Like it's not for autism assessments, ADHD, behavioral issues or chronic, because for these things, telehealth is not as good. You have to see face-to-face -face with a pediatrician would be better. But if it's just croup and you need a script urgently for prednisone or trouble or asthma action plan or so almost anything that will bring you to emergency, unless it's a real emergency, go to the emergency. But otherwise, more than happy to email us or go onto the website. It's exactly the same details. And you get also the same service of email support, calling you again after a few days to see how things are going. Thank you. That sounds really clear. I think that's brilliant. Dr. Samuel, thank you so much for making the time to have this conversation with me today. It's wonderful that families Australia-wide now have the convenience of speaking with a qualified, experienced medical professional, um, especially with a new baby, when getting out of the house sometimes is a chore in itself. So I'd love to thank you for talking to us about Telebaby, and I look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you. Thank you so Have much. Great.